Thank you and thanks to all the organizers for your invitation. It's always a great pleasure to be here in Lumini. So uh, all of this is going to be uh, ongoing joint work with uh, Rémi Coulon, Arnaud Illion and uh, Gilbert Levitt. So um, here is a, a very general question. I'm going to let G be a um, uh, finitely generated group and I'm going to fix a finite generating set S uh, for G. So here is a, a general question I can ask. I, I'm going to pick some um, automorphism of G. A natural thing to look at is uh, what are the possible growth types for uh, the world lengths measured with respect to this finite generating set S of uh, an element G of the group as you start iterating your automorphisms as n goes to infinity. Right, so for example, I'd like to know whether this growth can be exponential or polynomial or whatever. What, what kind of behaviors can you see for growth of elements under iteration of phi as n goes to infinity? And also, uh, I'm going to allow to let uh, g vary in the group. And then a question I can ask is, for example, how many different exponential growth rates can I find as my element is varying in g? Right, so somehow, what are the possible growth types of elements and the iterations of phi, and, and also how many different growth types can you see as you let the element g vary in the group? Of course, you expect that the answers to those questions are uh, going to depend on, on everything here, on the group, on the automorphism that you pick, and uh, of course on the element g, but somehow the idea is that the answer to this question should kind of reflect the, the geometry of the group that you are studying. And there is uh, an analogous question that you can ask for uh, outer automorphisms of the group. So if I now let capital V be uh, an outer automorphism of G, well now, outer automorphisms naturally act not on elements of the group, but on conjugacy classes of elements. And the analogous question would be to ask what are the possible growth types for the conjugacy length of phi to the n of, say, a conjugacy class of G, right? With, so this is defined to be the infimum over all elements G primes conjugate to G of uh, the world length of uh, phi to the n of G. Again, as n goes to infinity and as g varies in the group. Okay, so these are um, very general questions that you can ask basically in any finitely generated group G. And uh, I should say that unless in some very uh, specific classes of groups, not much is known about these uh, questions. For example, to my knowledge, it's uh, not known uh, whether there is a, a single example of a group G and an automorphism for which you can find elements that grew um, slower than any exponential but faster than any polynomial. Okay, so the goal of, of my talk today is going to be to investigate this question in the case where a G is, uh, let's say, a torsion free um, for simplicity. Uh, gram of hyperbody group. <clears throat> in the sense that triangles in the Cayley graph of G are uh, slim. Okay, so I I'm going to start with a, a small remark to say that actually in this setting of hyperbody groups, you can reduce the first questions about automorphisms 
to uh, the second question about outer automorphisms. Thanks uh, to the following trick. So if I'm given an automorphism of G, I'm going to make the following constructions. I'm going to let G hat be a, a new hyperbolic group, which is going to be the free product of G and a copy of Z. And I'm going to denote by T a generator for the Z factor. And uh, G hat has a, a natural generating set, which is the union of the generating set I, st I started with on G and this new element T. And now, uh, my automorphism phi naturally extends to an automorphism of G hat by uh, simply demanding that uh, phi hat restricted to G is equal to phi, and phi hat sends uh, my new element T to itself. And I'm going to denote by capital phi hat the outer class of phi in, uh, in, in out of G hat. OK, now here is the observation. If I pick any element G in uh, G, then uh, if I look at the conjugacy length in S hat of phi hat to the n of Tg, right? So, so what is this? Well, this element is nothing but uh, phi hat to the n of T is T times phi to the n of G. And because of the free product structure, this uh, word here is reduced, is cyclically reduced, and therefore its conjugacy length is uh, nothing but 1 plus the world length of phi to the n of G. And therefore I'm saying that if I understand the groups of these uh, conjugacy lengths in G hat, then uh, I understand the groups of real lengths in world lengths um, in the group G. So it's enough to answer question two for the group G hat, which is also a hyperbolic group, to uh, deduce a question, question one for um, G. Right, so that's why in, in the sequel of the talk, I'm um, always gonna work with outer automorphisms. <clears throat> okay, so let me uh, give you a, a couple of examples of uh, groups where these questions were previously understood. So maybe um, the very first example I could say, which is non-hyperbolic, is uh, if you just let G be a free abelian group, Z to the N, then, uh, well, its outer automorphism group is just a linear group, G, L, and Z. And now, really, the question you are asking is, you pick a matrix in GLN, and uh, you apply the powers of this matrix to an element, to, to a vector in ZN, and you want to understand how the norm of the vector is going to grow under uh, the powers of your matrix. This is basic linear algebra. You know that uh, to do this, you just you know, use the Jordan normal form of the matrix, and you realize that uh, the growth of uh, any element is always going to be uh, uh, given by a polynomial times an exponential, right, where the exponential growth rates are precisely going to be uh, the eigenvalues of uh, your matrix, and, and here you have a bound on the degree of the polynomial, which is just given by the size of the matrix. Okay, so now uh, let's move on to the hyperbolic settings. So maybe the, the first example that was uh, completely understood is the case where G is uh, the fundamental group of, uh, say, um, closed hyperbolic surface, orientable surface of, of genus at least two. Okay, so in this case, Thanks to the then Nielsen Bear theorem, we know that the outer automorphism group of G is nothing but uh, the extended mapping class group of sigma, which is defined to be the group of all um, isotopy classes of um, diffeomorphisms of the surface. 
Okay, now uh, in the setting of surfaces, there are uh, several natural ways of measuring length of um, elements of the pi one, lengths of curves on the surface. One thing you can do is uh, do what I, I did before, use the conjugating length with respect to some uh, fixed generating set for the pi one of the surface. But another thing you could do is fix some uh, hyperbolic metric on the surface and given the curve in the surface, define its hyperbolic length to be uh, the length measured by uh, integration of the metric of the unique geodesic representative with respect to this hyperbolic metric in the isotopic SFC. And it turns out that for closed surfaces, uh, the conjugacy lengths with respect to a fixed generating set or uh, this hyperbolic lengths are uh, by Lipschitz equivalent to one another. So really here, uh, the, the question translates into the following. I'm <coughs> starting with a curve on the surface and I'm given a mapping class phi of the surface a diffeomorphism of sigma and I start iterating phi apply it to the curve and I want to understand how the length, the hyperbolic length of the curve is going to grow as uh, n goes to infinity. And this question has been uh, understood by Thurston who proved, um, for example, the following statement that uh, associated to any mapping class of the surface is uh, a finite set of um, exponential growth rates whose number only depends on um, the genus of the surface. And we satisfy the following, that if you pick any curve on the surface and you start uh, iterating phi, then uh, the, the length of the curve is going to have a well-defined exponential growth rate under iteration of phi, which is going to be equal to one of these lambda i's. So uh, there exists I suggest, so the, the following limit is always going to exist, right? So each curve has a well-defined exponential growth rate, and the only growth rates that you see belong to this uh, finite family. So it may happen in this statement that one of the lambda i's is equal to one, in which case it means that you have curves that grew uh, sub-exponentially under uh, iteration of phi. And in this case, uh, you can say better, if you have a curve that grows sub-exponentially under iteration of phi, then actually its growth is either linear or uh, its length is just bounded under iteration of phi. Okay, so how, how does one prove this? Well, um, the first thing that Thurston does is uh, understand growth in the case where phi is a pseudo-unusov diffeomorphism of the surface, meaning that it mixes all curves on the surface. And what he proves is that uh, if phi is a pseudo-unus of diffeomorphism of the surface, then actually what happens is that all curves on the surface are going to grow uh, exponentially fast at the same speed. So the limit is the same for all curves, and the limit is what is usually called the stretching factor of the pseudo-unus of diffeomorphism, which is also the amount by which phi is uh, dilate, dilating and contracting its uh, fixed measured foliation on, on the surface. So the way Thurston understood the case of pseudo unusov is actually by uh, studying these uh, measured foliations on the surface which are left invariant by phi. 
And now, uh, once you've understood the case where phi is pseudo Unosov, well, what happens is that in general, up to replacing phi by some power, you're always going to be able to find a um, phi invariant decomposition of the surface into uh, various subsurfaces. Right, so maybe up to replacing phi by phi to the k, you, you have this decomposition of the surface into various subsurfaces, and I'm claiming that phi fixes uh, the isotopic class of each of the subsurfaces from this decomposition. And in addition, so, so phi preserves each of the pieces, and in addition, in restriction to each of the pieces, there are two possibilities. Either phi is a pseudo of diffeomorphism of the subsurface, and, and you, might, you may have several subsurfaces in restriction to which phi is a pseudo of, possibly with distinct stretching factors. And you can also have subsurfaces in restriction to which phi just acts like uh, the identity. Plus, uh, what can happen is that uh, you may have then twisting about uh, the various curves from the decomposition, right? Meaning that if you have a transverse curve, it, it may get twisted about uh, the, the white curve from the decomposition and the iteration of phi. Now, so, so what does this tell us uh, about growth? Well, now, what happens is, uh, if you pick a curve C, which is entirely confined in some identity subsurface, then, of course, as you are iterating phi, well, the, the curve is not going to grow. So this is the case where length is bounded. Now, if you have a curve which only meets identity subsurfaces, but maybe crosses some of the curves from the decomposition, then what happens is you, you can have then twisting, and uh, each time the, the green curve gets twisted, basically its length is going to increase roughly by the length of the white curve along which you are twisting. So when you iterate, the length of the green curve is going to uh, increase linearly fast. So linear growth comes from then twists. And finally, uh, the kind of generic situation is if, if you have a curve which crosses some of the pseudo of pieces from the decomposition, then it's actually going to grow exponentially fast, and its exponential growth rate is always going to be equal to the maximal stretching factor of a pseudo of piece that uh, it crosses. Right, so you, you get the, the growth from uh, this decomposition. And notice actually that the proof gives a, a bit better than what I've written here, because uh, it, it tells you that, like, th this is not just uh, some abstract statement. The, the, the growth rates are really related to some geometric structure on the surface, which is this uh, um, decomposition into various subsurfaces, which is phi invariant. Right, so you, you can, I mean, you can locate where the various growth rates lambda i uh, arise in the picture. Okay, so this uh, kind of solves these questions in the case of a fundamental group of um, hyperbolic surfaces. Well, th there are still interesting questions related to this. For example, it's known that the lambda i's that can arise as stretching factor of pseudo unus of diffeomorphisms are always algebraic integers, but uh, I think it's still open which are precisely the uh, algebraic integers that can arise as stretching factors of uh, pseudo unus of diffeomorphisms. There are restrictions uh, to, for, for them, but the, the precise uh, list is, is not known. Okay, so. My uh, second example of a hyperbolic group uh, where uh, growth under automorphisms was previously understood is the case where G is uh, a finitely generated free group. In which case, uh, the analog of Thurston's theorem 
uh, basically follows from um, Besvina and Handel's work on uh, what they call train tracks for free groups. And, and maybe I should say that the, the specific question of groups was uh, addressed a bit later by Levitt. And uh, the, the statement is very similar so to any outer automorphism of Fn. You can associate a finite set of uh, exponential growth rates, which again actually are algebraic integers, and whose number is bounded by a, a constant that only depends on the rank of the free group. So Levitt gave uh, the, the optimal bound of 3n minus 2 over 4 growth rates that are strictly greater than 1. And again, if you uh, pick any uh, element in the free group and you start iterating phi uh, and apply it to g, then it's going to have a well-defined growth rate. So this limit is well-defined, which actually is already not obvious. And moreover, it's equal to one of these finitely many uh, lambda i's. Again, it's possible that some elements grew uh, sub-exponentially fast, and in this case, what you can conclude is that uh, actually the growth is a polynomial. So it's not necessarily linear. You have, you can have groups of a um, higher polynomial degree. Um, still, there is a bound on the degree uh, of groups of an element under iteration of phi, which is basically n minus 1. OK, in, in this setting, you can actually be a bit more precise than just one, what I've written. And uh, they show that uh, if you pick uh, any element g, you can find so an exponential growth rate lambda i, a polynomial degree, let's call it n, and a constant c, such that the growth of phi n of g is comprised between c times uh, lambda i to the n times n to the m, and 1 over c times uh, lambda i to the n times n to the m. Right, so you, you really have a, a much more precise estimate. Growth is really like a polynomial times an exponential. With finitely many exponential growth rates and with a bound on um, the degree of the polynomial part of the growth. Okay, maybe I should give um, some examples. For example, I can uh, show you uh, an automorphism uh, already in rank 3, which uh, grows uh, quadratically, for, for which you have a conjugacy class which grows quadratically under iteration of phi. So what you can do is pick uh, the following. So you send, so uh, I'm denoting by A, B, C, uh, free basis for F3. I'm sending C to itself, B, let's say to B, C. Now, now when you iterate, the, the growth of B is going to be linear. And if I send A to AB, then uh, you can easily check that uh, A is going to grow quadratically under uh, iteration of this automorphisms of the free group. I mean, you can write the corresponding matrix uh, where you, know, you write that A is sent to AB, B is sent B, C, and C, and to C, and uh, study groups for the uh, iterates of this matrix. OK, and, and another remark that uh, I wanted to make on this statement is that um, in the setting of free groups, there is an analog to this uh, geometric decomposition of the surface, which is what I like to, to call the tree of subgroups 
detecting uh, the exponential growth rate. <laughs> so what does this mean? Well, this means that given your automorphism phi, you can find a sort of tree of subgroups of Fn. So here, my subgroups A1, A2, A3 are subgroups of Fn. And then maybe B1, B2, B3 are subgroups of A1, et cetera, et cetera. I have a tree of subgroups. And uh, to every vertex in this tree, there is an associated exponential growth rate where you just require that the growth rate of a descendant is always smaller than uh, the growth rate of its parent. And, and now the statement is that if you pick an element in the free group, which is a conjugate into one of the nodes of the filtrations, let's say, for example, conjugate into A1, but not into any of its descendants, then its growth is precisely going to be given by uh, the growth rate associated to A1. Right, so this kind of decomposition of Fn as a tree of subgroups. So your tree depends on phi. The tree depends on phi, yes, yes. Yeah. Right, so for an example would be if you take, I don't know, um, let's say phi is the following automorphism of F4, where I'm saying, uh, let's do something like this. I hope that this is supposed to give uh, exponential growth on the AD factor, where uh, the exponential growth rate is, is basically given by uh, the top eigenvalue of the corresponding matrix of this automorphism. So you, you have exponential growth rate with a growth rate equal to lambda 1. And then maybe on CD, I'm going to do the following. I'm going to choose. And also an exponentially growing automorphism that grows faster than the one on the bottom. But also I'm going to add here the letter A, so that as you start iterating on C on D, you're going to start getting letters from the AB factor. Right? So the AB factor is invariant, and the CD factor kind of wraps over the AB factor under iteration of phi. And now, uh, if I did this correctly, what should happen is that you have this AB factor where all elements have growth lambda 1, exponential growth rate lambda 1 under iteration of phi. And all elements which live outside of this AB factor are going to start getting letters from C, D, A, and B. And they're going to grow with uh, another growth rate lambda 2, which is uh, greater than lambda 1. So this would be my uh, tree of uh, exponential growth rates associated to this automorphism phi. OK, so the, the, way, um, the way this theorem is proved in, in the context of free groups uses, as I mentioned, um, what is called Besvina and Handel's theory of train tracks for, for free groups. But uh, somehow I don't really want to comment on this, because uh, the point is that we want to generalize this statement in, in the context where G is a, a general hyperbolic group. And in the setting of general hyperbolic groups, we have no good notion of train tracks. So we needed to use a completely different strategy to uh, attack the similar questions. But uh, in the, the general setting, of, um, let's say, torsion-free gram of hyperbolic groups. And still, we can prove the following two statements. So this is with Rémi Coulon, uh, Arnaud Illion, and Gilbert Levitt. So uh, OK, let G be a torsion-free gram of hyperbolic group. 
So there are two features. The, the first is that you have finitely many exponential growth rates. And the second is that you have a dichotomy between uh, exponential growth rates and polynomial growth rates. And these are the two features that we're going to uh, generalize in the general setting. So the first is associated to every outer automorphism of G is a, a finite set of exponential growth rates whose number is bounded by a constant that uh, only depends on the group. And we can actually also prove that there are algebraic integers, although I'm not going to um, talk about this parts today. And now if you pick any element of G, well, it has a well-defined exponential growth rate and their iteration of phi, which is equal to one of these finitely many lambda i's. So finitely many exponential growth rates and the second statement, maybe I should say that this one is still in progress, is that, uh, well, you have this dichotomy between exponential growth versus polynomial. So if you have an element that grows sub-exponentially fast, then actually it, its growth is um, polynomial. Again, with a bound on the degree that only depends on the group. And actually, maybe, so, so it, it's not all, it can be polynomial of higher degree, as we saw in the case of free groups, but somehow there is a distinction uh, between groups that are one-ended, like uh, the fundamental group of a closed surface, groups that do not admit any free splitting, and groups which are infinitely ended, like free groups. And actually what we show is that if the group G is one-ended, then when growth is polynomial, actually growth is linear. And, and when the group is not one-ended, then you, you can have a um, higher degree for polynomial growth. Okay, so my goal for uh, the rest of the talk is uh, gonna be to explain you the ideas in the proof of the first theorem, uh, finding uh, finitely many exponential growth rates for elements under iteration of phi. Okay, so our proof has uh, basically two steps. The first step consists in uh, somehow finding the maximal exponential growth rate. And more precisely what we're gonna do, and this is probably the key proposition in our work, is we're gonna find, we're gonna build a kind of a limiting object, which is gonna be a G action on a tree, which in a sense encodes this maximal exponential growth rate. So the statement is the following. There exists an R tree T equipped with a, a G action by isometries, non-trivial with no global fixed point, um, which detects the, the maximal exponential growth rate in the sense that all elements of the group that act hyperbolically with positive translation lengths on the tree. So what I denote uh, in this way is the minimal displacement of an element in the tree under uh, the action of G. Right, so whenever you have an element that uh, acts hyperbolically in this sense on T, which is equivalent to saying that G does not fix any point in the tree, then, the growth rate is uh, well defined, and it's the same for uh, all the elements that act, act loxodromically on T. And it's maximal in the sense that if you pick any other element, typically one that fixes a point in the tree, then uh, it's gonna grow slower 
in the sense that uh, the limb soup of this quantity is going to be smaller, smaller than them. I, I'm not claiming for the moment that the, the limit exists here, uh, because it's, it's actually hard and it's part, part of the uh, part of the proof is to, the, the, the hard part of the proof is actually to show that this uh, limit does exist. And now, uh, once you've this, so you have detected the maximal exponential growth rate, and you're left understanding growth of elements that uh, live in point stabilizers of the treaty. And then this is done by a kind of induction argument, which consists in showing that all point stabilizers in the tree T are uh, phi invariant, or this is an outer automorphism. I should say the conjugacy classes of point stabilizers in the tree are uh, phi invariant, and they are uh, of smaller complexity for a well-chosen notion of complexity, think that if G were a free group, the complexity would just be the rank, and I would be claiming that uh, in the tree T that we built, uh, if this is an Fn tree, then uh, the rank of point stabilizers in T, uh, the, the point stabilizers in T have rank strictly smaller than N. And then because you have this uh, decreasing complexity, you can just restrict phi to each of these point stabilizers and uh, by induction on the complexity, find the growth rates uh, in restriction to each of these point stabilizers. And this uh, will conclude the proof of the theorem. And you kind of get this uh, kind of tree of subgroups where uh, you know, the, the AIs would be the point stabilizers in the tree that you find in the first step, and then you restrict the action to A1, you're gonna get an A1 tree, and the points, BIs would be the, the point stabilizers in the next tree that you build, and so on and so on. So really, the, the key step is to prove, to build this uh, limiting action. Stabilizers after the COVID? Um, yeah, I think that's correct, because um, so the, the point is the, when you have a point stabilizer in an R tree, you can use uh, analysis of actions of R trees to view it as a point stabilizer in a simplicial tree uh, with edge group isomorphic to Z, and, and then you get convexity. Okay, so let me explain you uh, how we prove this, how we build this limiting tree. So I'm gonna start with a, a Cayley graph of G with respect to uh, my fixed generating set S. So notice that uh, there is uh, G action by isometries by left translations on X. And the definition is made so uh, that if I look at the translation length of G acting in X in the sense of this minimal displacement, it's the same as uh, what I call the conjugacy length of G with respect to uh, the generating set S. Okay, and now starting from this Cayley graph, I'm gonna twist the action using my automorphism. So X phi, is gonna be, well, as a metric space, it's gonna be x, but I'm changing the action of g, twisting it by the automorphism. So my new action is uh, an element g is gonna act on a point for this new action in the same way as phi of g was acting on x for uh, the original action. where phi here denotes uh, basically any uh, representative of capital phi in its uh, outer class. And, and this doesn't depend on a choice up to uh, equivariant isometry. 
And now this definition is made, so that now the translation length of G in X phi is the conjugacy length of phi of G. And if I start iterating, I look at the, the twisted actions by uh, phi to the n, and, and now the translation length of an element in this space is uh, precisely the quantity whose asymptotics I'm trying to understand. Okay, and now uh, this sequence of metric spaces, the x phi to the n, so you have a sequence of uh, delta hyperbolic spaces, and you'd like to uh, somehow make them converge to a limiting object, which is going to be this tree. But the point here is, typically if phi has infinite order, which is the, the only interesting case, uh, in x phi to the n, you're going to have elements of the group whose translation lengths becomes uh, arbitrarily big as n goes to infinity. So if you want to have any chance to make the sequence of metric spaces converge to anything, you should better renormalize it by a, a renorma re renormalizing constant that tends to zero as n goes to infinity, so that the hyperbolicity constants of these spaces uh, shrinks to zero, and in the limit you expect to get a zero hyperbolic metric space i.e. Uh, an action on a tree. And, and this is made possible thanks uh, to the following theorem that was proved uh, independently by Bezvina and Poulin, which says that indeed, so th there is a compactness argument, so it's up to passing to a subsequence. You can find a renormalizing sequence converging to zero such that these metric spaces converge as n goes to infinity to a non-trivial uh, G action on a tree. And this convergence is uh, for what is called the equivariant realm of Hausdorff topology, which roughly means that um, if you take any big finite subtree in T, then uh, your going to be able to lift it almost isometrically just before the limit. Okay, and now uh, the, the naive idea that uh, we could have from here is to say that if you pick any element in the group, then um, then say the Translation lengths of G in this space, which is nothing but lambda n times the translation length of, times the conjugacy length of phi n of G, is going to converge to the translation length of G in T. And therefore, you want to say that if this translation length is positive, then the growth of phi to the n of G is a asymptotically equivalent to one over lambda n. So it should be the same for all elements acting hyperbolically on T. However, there is one difficulty here, which is that all of this is true only up to a subsequence. And really, in their argument, they use a compactness argument, and there is no way of uh, controlling the subsequence that you need to take to get this convergence. And the problem for us is that we don't want to understand the growth under a subsequence of phi to the n, but really along the whole sequence. So there is a real difficulty here coming from the fact that this convergence is only true up to a subsequence. Okay, so what are we going to do? So we have this space, which is made of uh, the orbit of x under uh, the iterate of phi. And I'm going to add in the limit the set of all uh, projective accumulation trees. By projective, I mean that I'm only considering these trees up to scaling 
which is the right thing to do if you want to have convergence. So this is a compact space. And uh, the point is, we're going to try to uh, prove this statement by studying the dynamics of phi acting on this space k. And uh, in, in order to somehow quantify the dynamics of phi acting on this space k, I'm going to introduce um, a kind of a distance on k. So given two g spaces x and y, I think points in k, I'm going to write the distance from x to y to be uh, something that uh, somehow measures um, the minimal amount of dilatation that you need to pass from x to y in a g-equivariant way. So you look at the infimal Lipschitz constant of a g-equivariant map from x to y. How much does it cost to pass from x to y in a g-equivariant way? So this, I'm going to denote this by Lipschitz constant from x to y, and my distance is the logarithm of this. Now, uh, an important quantity for us is going to be uh, to look at the speed at which x phi to the n is escaping from x with regards to this distance. So I'm going to define the drift of um, my um, kind of dynamical system to be the limit of uh, 1 over n times the distance from my base point to x phi to the n. This limit is well defined, just because this sequence is subadditive. And uh, I'm carefully going to denote it by log of lambda. OK, and now uh, the, the first interesting observation is that the drift always gives us an upper bound to the growth of uh, elements in G under iteration of phi. Why is this? Because if I pick any element in the group, and if I uh, compare the conjugating x of phi and of G, which is the translation length of G in this space, to the translation length of G in x, then you see that if you have a Lipschitz map from x to x phi to the n, the translation length of an element can be multiplied at most by its Lipschitz constant when you apply f. So you get this inequality, but this, by definition, grows like uh, lambda to the n, right? Because it's the exponential of the, the distance. And therefore, you uh, get that for every element, the lim soup of this quantity is always smaller than lambda, which gives us one inequality, actually this one. Right, and the point now is to prove that we can find some tree in this set of accumulation for which every element that is hyperbolic in T will satisfy a reverse inequality. And the problem is that, you know, because all of this is, is made using uh, compactness arguments, there is kind of no preferred choice of a tree in this set of accumulation. And because we have no preferred choice for an accumulation tree, what we're going to do is we're just going to pick one at random. So there is a natural probability measure on the space k, which is you take a weak limit of, um, let's say, uh, the, the averages of the Dirac measures on the n first points 
that you see uh, on the orbit. And you take a, a weak limit of this, which is possible because uh, the space is compact and metrizable. So you can take a weak limit on this, and, and this means that whenever you have a continuous function from k to the reals, then uh, the average of f integrated along nu is going to be equal to this kind of And now the claim and, and this uses an argument which is actually due uh, to Carlson and Le Drapier, but they work in a much more general setting than uh, what we do, and this has a kind of easy interpretation in our case. The point is that uh, for almost every tree, with respect to this measure, the drift, which was defined as uh, somehow the speed at which uh, the, the, this uh, uh, process is escaping the base point x, the drift, the speed at which you are escaping from x, is also equal to the speed at which you are approaching the tree t. So the claim is that uh, for almost every t in the space k, with respect to this probability measure, the drift is also equal to the speed at which you are uh, approaching t, which I'm going to denote as the following limit. So there is a minus sign that naturally comes, and you look at the distance between x phi to the n and t. This is really the, the translation of the fact that the speed at which you are escaping from x is equal to the speed at which you are uh, approaching the limiting treaty. Okay, you may complain that this is not really well defined because t is only defined up to scaling, so this distance does not really make sense, but uh, when you take the limit, the, the limit is not going to depend on, on the scaling you choose for t. And now, uh, let's see how to conclude the proof of the key proposition that I shouldn't have erased. From this fact, so now I, I can use uh, the same kind of inequality as over there. So the, for uh, any element in the group, the translation lengths, if I compare the translation lengths of g in t and the translation lengths of g in uh, x phi to the n, which is the, translation, the conjugacy lengths of phi to the n of g, then this is uh, at most multiplied by uh, the Lipschitz constant from x phi to the n to t. But you see that so this distance is, is roughly minus n log lambda, so this Lipschitz constant is roughly lambda to the minus n. And this should tell you that the norm of phi to the n of g is roughly bigger than lambda to the n times the norm of g in t, which precisely tells you that uh, if the norm of g in t is positive, then you have the reverse inequality. So the lim inf of this quantity is um, at least equal to lambda. And this is precisely what we wanted, and this finishes the proof of um, our key proposition. So I have five minutes left. I can uh, explain you uh, how, how to prove this claim. saying that uh, the drift is also the speed at which you are approaching the treaty. <laughs> OK. 
OK, so I, I'm going to introduce the, the following continuous function on my space k. So uh, 2 or 3 t, I'm going to associate the following quantity. I look at the distance from x to t minus the distance from x phi to t. So this measures how much you've approached t as you moved one step of the process. As you move from x to x phi, how much have you been approaching t? And now uh, I claim that the average amount by which you are approaching a tree t is nothing but the drift, log of lambda. Indeed, let's compute this by definition of the measure. This is equal to the limit of uh, 1 over n times uh, the sum of f x phi to the i. And let's just do the computation. So you have distance from x to x phi to the i minus distance from x phi to x phi to the i, uh, but using uh, the, uh, the fact that the action is by isometry is the same as distance from x to x phi to the i minus 1. And you have a kind of telescopic sum, and you're left with just the term distance from x to x phi to the i. Right, so this is the drift. The average amount by which you are approaching a tree t with respect to this measure nu is just the drift of the process. Now, uh, I have another way of evaluating the same quantity, which is use um, Birkhoff's self-guarding theorem. And you see that so this is equal to uh, the limit of uh, f evaluated in uh, phi to the i applied to t for almost every tree. And again, if I uh, make this computation, Let's do it f of phi to the i t. So I have the distance from x to phi to the i t. This turns out to be the same as the distance from x phi to the i to t. And then distance from x phi to phi to the i t. This should be distance from x phi to the i plus 1 to t. Again, you have a telescopic sum, and you see that the only term you're left with is uh, this one with n. So you get limit of minus 1 over n distance from x phi to the n to t, which is uh, exactly what I claim, exactly the, the, this limit here. OK, so this finishes the proof of the OK, okay there, there is a little cheat here, because I have not proved that the measure is ergodic, so I cannot really apply Birkhoff's ergodic theorem. But if you decompose into the ergodic components, you can uh, get this, um, the, the proof of this claim. And, and therefore, this concludes the proof of the key proposition and then the finiteness of the exponential growth rates and their uh, iteration of Can you say what the tree T will be in the free group example you did for us? Like the rank three example or rank four? Oh, what, what, what is the, the tree going to be? Yeah, what is the tree in your key proposition for the fee, the rank yeah, four example yeah. you did? Uh, OK, so, so I mean, from, from the proof, we do not really construct the tree because we, we pick a we pick it at random. But for example, if you had an e whip in a free group, then you could construct this uh, li limiting tree just by you know, taking a train track, iterating, and proving that this converges. 
So the point is, in free groups, you can sometimes do better than this uh, compactness argument of Besvina and Polin. Sometimes you can really construct a limiting tree and prove that for, uh, if you start from a Cayley graph of the free group and iterate phi, and this is really going to converge to a tree as n goes to infinity, not up to passing to a subsequence. Or maybe up to replacing phi by your power, but this would be okay. But it's, you don't need a compactness argument. So yeah, I guess if, if you have a new whip, you just start from a train track and iterate. And, 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 and I mean, in general, you can use relative train tracks and these kind of things. Uh, and, and typically, so if you have a two strata automorphisms, as, as I said, uh, so this kind of things, then, I mean, typically elements in here grow slower, so in the limit you're going to get a tree where the AB subgroup is elliptic, this is a point, and all other elements are going to act um, hyperbolically. So this is going to tell you that all elements but those living in AB grows at the same speed, which is maximal, and then you zoom in this AB factor, uh, you, you just apply this automorphism, you, you get a, lim a new limiting tree, and then you get the growth in, in the AB factor. So do you have a concrete example of the hyperbolic group and the outer automorphism for which the, the limit out really depends on the subsequence? No. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a theoretical no. construction. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, no, I, I mean, okay, maybe sometimes, as I said, you, you may need to pass to a proper power before getting convergence, but but this would be okay because, like, the problem would be if you have a sparse sequence. But no, I, I don't have a concrete example of, of this. It's just that the way they construct it is, is, is by this kind of compactness argument. And, and to yeah, this is the point. In free groups, you have more precise constructions that allow you to prove that there is convergence. But in general, hyperbolic groups, I, I don't know how how to do this. You said at one point that the, 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 gross the, the gross factor of the lambda i are algebraic integers. Yes. So in the surface and free group case, I can see who, where yeah. this comes from, but here, yeah, can it, you explain? Yeah, here it doesn't come from this proof. <laughs> yes, because uh, like from the probabilistic argument, we don't get any information about algebraic integers. The, the point is, in fact, the really the crucial point of this proof is to show that the limit exists, which is not easy. And once you know that the limit exists, you can kind of use um, crude inequalities to uh, relate. So if you have a hyperbolic group, it, it may um, have a non-trivial Grushko decomposition, so it may split as a free product. And then you get train tracks coming from the free product structure. So you get algebraic integers coming from these train tracks. And also, if you look at the one-ended pieces of, of the hyperbolic group, they are made of surface subgroups. And you have the JSJ decomposition, you have surface subgroups, and uh, what they call rigid subgroups, which are, which are subgroups that have no automorphism. So basically, all the growth comes from surfaces. All the growth in the one-ended pieces comes from surfaces, and the growth from the free product structure comes from train tracks. And so, so the point is we, we didn't manage to have a kind of combination theorem to prove directly that the limit exists without using all these probabilistic techniques just from you know, the, the free product structure and what happens in the one in the subgroups. But once we know that the limit exists, we can uh, use crude estimates to say, for example, that uh, you know, the, the, the maximal growth is, for example, was going to be bigger than the maximal growth in a subsurface, because of course you have elements in the subsurface. And, and you, you, get, you, you write inequalities and you see that the lambda i's have to coincide with either lambda i's coming from the surfaces or lambda i's coming from the free product structure. <laughs> Can you play with, instead of having one phi, having, for instance, two phi one and phi two and playing with yes, them arbitrary? Uh, 
or more than that. Uh, flag. Yeah, I, I guess some probability of choice. I yeah, I guess it. actually you can just run a random walk on yeah. so out of get G. Some tree, yeah. So I mean, uh, in, in my PhD thesis, I did this in the case of three groups. For if, if you take a simple random walk on a simple random walk on a free group, then you can show that. Uh, um, for every element, almost surely the, the limit and, and they're applying the random product of automorphism is, is going to exist and, and be the same for all elements. Yes. And I would expect that, okay, we, we haven't written it up, but I would expect that if, if you wish, you can do a random walk on, on out of G. And so, so I'm wondering if. Uh, if you actually get something out of for these growth rates of general free products, provided you have some case, some some information about the growth of the vertex of the uh, free factors in the Grosch body composition. Yeah, I, I don't know because, as I say, we don't have um, a kind of uh, <coughs> combination theorem. Um, like what you can do is is. Like if instead of looking at the growth in the world metric, you look at the growth in the Grushko deformation space, then you can do this uh, by, by <laughs> even by using train tracks, actually, but also probably by these techniques. But I don't know. If, if you say, I know the growth in the factors, and I want to deduce the, the growth in the world metric for the free product, I don't know. Uh, when, 